joining us. My name is Sarah Kincaid. I'm the president of AWC in Springfield this year on the board. Um, so we appreciate you joining us. We are going to be hearing about diversity and inclusion in your communications from Carla. She's our guest speaker today. So um, we'll hear a little bit more about her in just a moment. But if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat for Carla, or we'll do a question and answer session at the end. Um, so with that, I'm going to let Christy Bacardo, who's our program's VP, one of them um, in, in AWC, she's going to introduce Carla to you. So thanks for joining us. Thanks everyone for being here today. Um, like Sarah said, I'm Christy Bricardo and I'm the co-VP of programs for our Women in Communications chapter, along with my friend Kelly Jessup, who's always working hard and she's beh behind the scenes here with us today. Um, we're so excited to see so many friends here today, as well as so many new members and faces, because this really is such an important topic. And I wanted to share that, you know, I met Carla at the Association Media and Publications Conference in Chicago. I was really fortunate to attend with one of my colleagues, Stephanie, and I think she's also here today. But um, Carla gave a presentation on diversity and inclusion that was eye opening for us. Um, she brought up issues that we hadn't even thought of. Um, things like how are we representing our members, our customers, our audience, in our words and in our images. Were we truly representing our audience base? Um, and should we think about the audience that we have now or the audience that we want to attract? And did we have diversity in age and gender and ethnicity? Um, so when I reached out to Carla and asked her to present, she generously offered her time. And she told me about a recent interview that she had done with Martin Luther King Jr. the third and that she had some really uh, great new insights to share with us today. So I'm really honored to introduce Carla Kalo Garitas. She's a president of Kalo, Kalo Media, and it's a custom publishing agency that helps associations, nonprofits, and companies create content, publication, and events that make them essential to the communities that they serve. And I will drop a links to Carla's bio, um, her LinkedIn bio in the chat. If you wanna get a copy of the presentation at the end, let Carla know, reach out to her and she'll send that to you. And we are recording the session for members only. It is one of the benefits of being a member of Women in Communication Springfield chapter. I'll put links to our chapter in the chat as well. Um, thank you, Carla, for being with us. And I'm gonna turn the stage over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, let me just first apologize for the sunlight streaming in through the window in the back, which was not planned for. Uh, it looks like I have a halo and I promise I am not that angelic, but um, maybe I'll switch it around as the, uh, as, as the sun changes. Um, first of all, can we just say, holy crap, 2020. You know, how is that for professional communications? Um, what a year this has been. I'm, I'm just so honored to share time with you today, talking about a topic that is so much at the forefront of our um, nation's story right now. And thank you, Christy and Sarah and the Association for Women in Communications um, for this invitation. You know, perhaps never before have terms like diversity, inclusion and equity been more on the minds of, um, of individuals and corporate America than they are now. And while some of you may have some new awareness initiatives in place, uh, maybe you've had them in place for a while, I'm pretty sure that others of you are maybe unsure of what you need to change in your content and your communication strategies and your policies. So I'm going to share a few thoughts, um, as well as one magazine publishing team's DNI journey, which is still ongoing. And then I'll reserve some time for us to ponder some um, sensitive, but I would say important questions on the topic of diversity and inclusion in communications and publishing. So first of all, um, are, we get, are we able to, yeah, there we go, advancing the slide. So first of all, I just wanna share that I am not a DNI expert. Um, I'm really just, you know, like you, an honest seeker for truth around this topic and trying to find ways that I can do better, looking at ways that we all can do better as professional communicators. And so here's just five seconds on who I am. Um, after five years on the editorial staff at McGraw-Hill, I launched a publishing business in 1993. Um, as Chrissy said, we're a boutique custom publishing services firm in St. Clair, Michigan. We work with associations and nonprofits like uh, the Mercedes-Benz Club of America, Association Media and Publishing, um, National Association for Fleet Man Manufacturers, 
Automotive Industry Action Group, Women's Life Insurance, uh, Society of Fire Protection Engineers, and others. And clearly, I am not a graphic designer because I just threw those logos up there for you. Um, we also work with B2B and consumer publishers, such as Hearst Motor Magazine and Real Leaders, which is a newsstand magazine about conscious leadership. And I'm going to share some more things about you with, uh, about Real Leaders in a moment. Um, here's Real Leaders, actually, a few covers here. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's, um, it's actually a great magazine that nobody's heard of. They're celebrating their 10th anniversary this year, and um, they give interviews with some pretty amazing people like Oprah and Sir Richard Branson, Greta Thunberg, Jane Goodall, um, Leonardo DiCaprio, Martin Luther King III, who I'm going to talk about more in a few minutes. So um, before you can make progress on your d &I journey, you have to pull your head out of the stand and take note of where you are. And that means literally measuring diversity and inclusion in your content. So for some of you, your content is probably published in a magazine or a journal. For others, it might be website copy or um, a press release or any newsletter or an annual report. Um, it might be all internal, shared with your just through corporate communications. But no matter what type of communicator you are or where your content is published and where it's seen by others, if you want to know where you truly are with DNI in your communications, you have to start with measuring. So as an example, here's the story of Signature Magazine, which is published by Association Media and Publishing. Amon P is the association for professional uh, association and nonprofit publishers and communicators and Signature is its members only magazine. So um, diversity and inclusion are important in a and but the staff began to wonder how effectively the magazine was reflecting the goals of diversity and inclusion in its content. Now, Signature isn't the first magazine to think about tracking its sources. Um, in 2018, a popular science writer with the uh, Atlantic, a gentleman by the name of Ed Young, wrote a piece about the importance of tracking diversity. He said that he tried for two years to improve the diversity in his sourcing. And in the end, he couldn't overstate the importance of tracking how he was doing just with a simple spreadsheet. Um, tracking is, and I, I'm quoting Ed here, a vaccine against self-delusion. So essentially you can think all you want about how important it is to improve d &I in your communications and publish content. But if you don't put in that extra step of holding yourself accountable, things quite frankly will never change. So in 2019, AMP was inspired to look at the DNI performance of its flagship magazine signature. And associate editor Thomas Marcetti went through the issues of all the magazines that we had published from 2018 to 2019. He counted every time a person was represented in the magazine, including writers, people who were quoted people who were only mentioned by name, people in photos, illustrations, and even advertisements. He counted the representation of people in advertisements, which um, we decided to, to count because um, even though we couldn't control the advertising content, it's still part of how people were perceiving us, readers were, were perceiving us. So in a nutshell, we approached each issue as a reader who knows nothing about a &P or the people in the magazine. And we counted based on the um, most obvious presentation of a person's gender or generation or ethnicity. And if any of those things weren't obvious about the person, we didn't count them in the total for that area. So out of 888 representations, here's how we measured. Um, for gender, for example, um, if we saw the names John Smith and Jane Smith, we assumed one male, one female. And overall, we did pretty well with gender. I um, mean, just about every category, we were mostly 50-50. But for generation, um, we divided people into two groups, millennials and younger, and we called those emerging professionals or the new guard. And the second group was generation X and older, which we called established professionals or veterans. And so as you can see in the graphic, we were 66% established professionals and, or veterans, and only 34% emerging professionals which of course includes the millennials. Um, and of course, the millennials make up the largest percentage of the workforce. So we didn't do a very good job there of, of balancing our sources when it came down to age demographic. Um, and here in ethnicity, uh, overall signature had a very white year. 
Um, we, we got worse as we were looking at individual categories in this because we weren't always able to um, assess ethnicity just by a name or a photo. But basically we had, and in the writer's category, we had 36 white, only one black and only one Middle Eastern. And when it came down to people we quoted in the magazine, we had 61 white, five black, two Middle Eastern and one Asian. So it was very clear that we had to take some more deliberate steps to implement a DNI initiative in our published content. Um, and, and this independent study that we did was kind of the impetus behind a brand new organizational wide DNI initiative that we've started now and will carry on into 2021. So um, here's another association briefly that's invested in diversity, inclusion, and equity and access. This is the National Association for Music Education or NAFME. NAFME publishes a, a quarterly magazine called Teaching Music and their audience is comprised of professional music educators from preschool through collegiate. And just very briefly, NAFME partners with, partnered with a consulting firm. They paid $150,000 for this firm to kind of evaluate the current state of unconscious bias among music educators and within their organization. And uh, this study was actually driven by their board because a previous executive director in 2016 was called out by the NEA for making racist comments um, at, at a conference, no less. And so the topic really got brought to the for forefront for this organization. And um, the purpose of this study is to help the NAFME board um, identify where they are as an industry and what can be done to advance DNI in their organization. So, so these are just a couple of examples of how groups are measuring this and how they're taking action. So, so why pay attention to this? Other than the obvious reasons of um, you know, human decency, uh, there are other reasons to pay attention to diversity and inclusion. So think about the young generation, uh, the really, really young, you know, your children and grandchildren. They have an intuitive understanding of technology, right? Because they've grown up with cell phones and apps in their hands from the very beginning. Now, um, Likewise, the current school age of kids is growing up with a culture of diversity and inclusion. So high school and college kids, and I have a college age child, um, they're regularly asked at the beginning of class, how do you identify? What are your pronouns? How would you like to be called and recognized? It's just a normal course of class business at the beginning of each new semester or quarter. So in five years, when these kids begin to graduate and enter the workforce, these older kids, what will they find at your organization? You know, will they find a diverse and inclusive culture or will they look at your organization and ask, where is everybody? Now, of course, you probably know the Merriam-Webster's 2019 word of the year, if you remember, it is they, that was the word of the year. And, you know, they named it because the, after they named the pronoun they as the word of the year, searches for the word rose 313%. Um, and in case you're wondering, the 2018 word of the year was justice and in 2017, it was feminism. Um, you wanna know what the 2020 word of the year is? Okay, I just made that up. That's uh, <laughs> it's like the only word I think that's fitting for 2020. And they haven't announced it yet in case you're wondering. So. Here are some important questions, seriously though, um, for communicators on this topic of DNI. How diverse are we in our publications, uh, print and online? And the importance here is don't guess, you've got to measure it. You've got to ask yourself, is it time, if we don't already, do, is it time to add DNI guidelines to our style guide? Do our communications and publishing teams need diversity training? Do we need to ask people we interview and guest authors for their personal pronouns? And if yes, how will we treat the communication of these personal pronouns in text? Should we ask for personal pronouns during our registration process and then add these pronouns to our name badges? Some of you are probably already doing this. And also important to ask, do any of these questions, even thinking about them, make you uncomfortable? What DNI questions are you afraid to ask? So here's a big one for many of you, and Christy alluded to this in her introduction. Um, in our content and communications, should we reflect the current state of our audience in our content 
or should we reflect the audience we are trying to attract? For example, if you host a conference and your conference attendees are 80 to 90% older white men, should the conference coverage reflect accurately the audience that was there or should it show the diversity of the group that you're trying to get involved? It's an interesting, it's an interesting thought, isn't it? Is it your job to lead your industry in DNI awareness? And do you have unconscious bias in your content and communications? Now, these next group of questions uh, are specifically for publishers. I know some of you are publishers. Um, and, and even so, these questions will probably relate to, to, to you, whether you publish a magazine or a journal or not. Um, are you concerned that an effort to be more diverse in content might leave out more qualified experts? in your stories. So for example, Real Leaders has a uh, gender, a content gender equality policy. That's a really big um, uh, initiative that was brought about by its president, Julie Van Ness. She put forth a policy that says that we have to have the exact same number of men and women interviewed, uh, an exact same number of men and women authors, and the exact same number of males and females represented in the photos in the magazine in every single issue. So a staff editor literally counts every name and every photo before the magazine goes to press. And if the number is off, the editor has to fix it, even if it means holding an article uh, and substituting another one to get the count exactly even. This is kind of interesting. You know, what do you think? Um, is this policy too restrictive or is it really just a demonstration of a strong commitment to gender equality? They also have a policy that the cover subject has to alternate between male and female. But what if you have a male in the cover rotation for the next issue and then you land an interview with um, Michelle, Michelle Obama, right? <laughs> or you have a female in the rotation for the next cover and then you land an interview with Bill Gates. Are you going to say, you know, sorry, Bill, we're happy to interview, interview you, but we're not going to put you on our cover because it's a woman's turn to get the cover? Not that Bill Gates would even care, but you get the point. Uh, the point is, what happens if our DNI policies feel restrictive instead of liberating? And what if our DNI efforts make us feel inauthentic? Um, if we're showing a diversity in content or an industry or profession that really isn't there yet? One side says you have to show the diversity so that more diverse groups will feel comfortable engaging. And the other side says, what if we are actually insulting people and being inauthentic because our communications and our publishing show a level of diversity that everyone in our community knows isn't really there. So to help with these tough questions, I got some practical advice from a group of colleagues and friends from the LG LGBTQ community. And these are tough things to think about. So I took this, these questions to them and here's some of the advice they have for you. First of all, they say, you don't have to be perfect right away. You, you just have to show that efforts are being made. Secondly, take advantage of the diversity that you are able to find in your organization and then do things with it. Take time to learn diversity's glossary of terms. And don't be afraid to ask questions about a term. Realize that, uh, for example, discussing someone's sexuality is not the same thing as discussing sex. Some more advice. Asking um, how do you identify might help someone feel seen, but if you're going to ask it, you have to ask it of everyone. You have to make it universal because no one wants an asterisk next to their name. Um, in other words, no one wants to, you know, look around the board table and realize that they are the token black person on the board. So if you're going to ask how someone identifies, you ask it of everyone. Um, here's some advice from this same group of folks, specifically for publishers. If, um, if an interviewee or an author requests a personal pronoun, try to honor it or just avoid use of pronouns completely. And that's kind of hard to do in an article, but it can be done. Uh, secondly, if, if someone's sexuality or identity is not relevant to the story, or if it feels labored to include it, they say it's best to leave it out. And when it comes to communicators, some advice from this group, um, 
don't try to figure out a DNI policy by yourself, you know, in a vacuum or behind closed doors. It's better to involve people who, who have a DNI perspective and who will really lean in and, and help you. Um, they also stress the importance of getting ideas from people who aren't involved, who aren't engaging, not only ideas from the ones who are already involved and already engaging. And to be authentic in your DNI efforts, you can't just do something one time and let it go. Um, you have to recognize that you're trying to you're trying to change an entire culture, and it's going to take some time. And some more advice for communicators: um, sincerely try to determine what is the it, what is the it that is keeping you from being diverse, and sometimes recognize that that it might be a who. And then look around, look around, and figure out who's missing, who's missing, um, what groups are missing from your company, from your customers, from the people that you're writing about or publishing about, um, who's missing? Now, here are some DNI resources um, that will help you along your journey. And I'll leave this slide up for a second while, um, before I click to the next one. And I know this is recorded and it's gonna be available to members. Um, and I can, if anyone wants to uh, message me who's not a member, I can share this presentation with you later if you don't have access to it and you wanna look at some of these resources again. Um, but I do wanna talk about Karen Yen briefly. Um, Karen is the founder and creator of the Conscious Style Guide. Some of you may be using this, but just in case, I wanna make sure you're aware of it. The Conscious Style Guide, which is um, really an essential guide to conscious language. Uh, she also publishes the Conscious Language newsletter, which you can subscribe to. And she has put together a database called the Editors of Color database, which uh, contains tools for diversifying your staff and your sources. She has another database called the Database of Diverse Databases. And these are networks and resources to help you connect with talented people of color and other diverse talent. So that's, that's kind of uh, some, some Good resources for you if you're not already familiar with them. Now, freelance writer Melanie Paget Powers recently interviewed Karen for Signature Magazine. And here are just a few quotes I pulled out of that article that you might want to think about. And these are quotes from Karen, Karen Yen. She says, um, you are limiting your content and yourselves if you don't examine your biases. She urges us to be a conscious editor and to write with compassion. She says, recognize that diversity is more than race and ethnicity. Otherwise, you're gonna risk, risk crushing out other types of diversity. And finally, she says, stay in touch with how language is evolving. How is language evolving in, in these modern times? And use language skillfully to improve your life. Now, we talked about um, Martin Luther King and my slides are not advancing. Hold on one second, let's see. Is my slide advancing or no? It's not, okay, hold on just a second. Not yet, Carla. Okay, oops. Here, oh, there, there we go. Hold on, there we go, whoops. We're gonna get it. It's very <laughs> sensitive, guys. I have to use a very light touch here. Hold on, bear with me. Okay, we got it. Martin Luther King. So Martin Luther King III, uh, civil rights advocate, global humanitarian. Um, he's the oldest living child of civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. He was of course age 10 when his father was assassinated. I was invited to interview him earlier this year for a cover story in Real Leaders. And we were talking about families with a culture of leadership. And that's his 11-year-old um, daughter, Yolanda, in the, in the picture with him there. They actually took this picture for us for the magazine. Um, and, and I interviewed her too. So Mr. King um, talked about the irony of how so many countries in the world are looking to the United States for leadership. And yet we are the most divided that we've ever been. He said, individuals um, can't focus only on what interests them we have to look at what serves humanity. And he said, individual leaders, which would be you and me, we need to help our communities get above the noise so that we can think at a different level about diversity and inclusion. 
In speaking about the role of individual leadership in moving the needle on world problems, he told me that you should start by deciding what kind of society you seek for yourself and your family, and then identify where you can make a contribution. Now, you might think that diversity and inclusion and choosing a pronoun and so forth is sort of a focus and movement from the young people. But Mr. King says, it's really important to listen to the young people. And I quote, he says, the truth is the young people are the ones leading us right now. He gave his examples, the Parkland students who worked so hard to mobilize people around the country regarding responsible gun legislation. He mentioned Greta Thunberg, who of course is leading us on climate issues and Little Miss Flint, who's leading us on the water crisis as one that happened in Flint, Michigan. He said, I'm inspired by children and how easily and naturally they take action. Unfortunately, adults don't, this is still Mr. King quoting, unfortunately, adults don't tend to get involved until they are affected by something directly. When there's a catastrophe, adults get engaged. But the kids are showing us that we can get engaged at any time in our life. You know, one silver lining in all the social unrest this past summer is that we are now probably more comfortable and willing to go there and have these uncomfortable conversations and discussions that will enlighten and improve us as human beings. And yet it's important to remember that even though it feels like we've covered a lot of ground this summer, our DNI journey is only in its infancy. And I'm going to share a little example. Um, this actually happened last week. This is my friend Kalaya. So last weekend, I went to visit a friend in Florida and Kalaya was nearby because he had just moved in the, into the area to start an internship. And so my friend and I were attending an outdoor event and this event was sponsored by Kalaya's new employer. So he stopped by to say hello. Now, right after we took this picture that you're looking at, a coworker walked up to him and she had Kalaya's new boss in tow. And so after being introduced to his new boss, who was a woman, um, the boss asked him to repeat his name. And he said, Kalaya. And she said, do you have a nickname? And he said that when he was in elementary school, the kids had called him Clay, but that as he got older, he switched back to his given name, which was Kalaya. The boss looked him in the eye, I was standing right there, and she says, that name is too hard to remember and too hard to pronounce, we'll call you Clay. And so Kalaya paused and he kind of softly and politely repeated that he really preferred to be called Kalaya. And without missing a beat, the boss smiled sweetly and responded, we're calling you Clay. I kid you not, this happened last week. So. The reason I share this story with you is to help you understand we really are as, as a nation and even as, as individuals and as a world, we are just at the beginning of this diversity journey. So what is your role in history as communicators? Um, accurate and truthful communications in my mind is the key. If you don't believe me, then you need to remember Maybe I can give you a little reminder of the importance of clear communications. Let's eat, Grandma. Let's eat, Grandma. Now, money isn't the root of all evil. Miscommunication is, and I'm sure Grandma would agree. Here are some thoughts on what you can do to help kind of further yourself in this DNI journey. You need to invest in your own professional development. You need to reach out to the diverse people in your life. And I know that we're all communicators, which means we like to hear ourselves talk. And um, I just, in this, in this framework of this discussion, um, think, about, think about that old adage you've always heard about real estate, that the, you know, the three secrets to real estate are location, location, location. Well, in DNI communications, the three secrets are listen, listen, listen. And then, don't be afraid to ask questions. How many times have we listened, but then we were afraid to ask a question um, because we're, we're worried we might say something offensive or we might show ignorance, right? Don't be afraid to ask questions. Be willing to go there, make yourself vulnerable. 
because, um, you know, trust me, these, these underrepresented people have felt vulnerable all their lives and you can do it too. Don't assume anything. Drop all your assumptions and everything you thought you knew. Try to go beyond every voice is welcome to every voice is essential. You know, in um, the interview with Mr. King, he told me a story about a time when he visited a school in Sudan. And here's what he said, these are his words and I quote, um, the school was in a tent. In fact, the whole place was a tent village. Our sponsor provided us with a shiny black Mercedes to drive out there. We got out of the car and the kids started running and pointing at the car and then running back in and bringing out more children and pointing at the car. And I thought, wow, materialism has even made it out here to these kids in Sudan. But then I realized that the car was so shiny they could see themselves reflected on it. They had never seen a mirror before and they were seeing images of themselves for the first time. You may think you know what is going on, but it's all a matter of perspective. And that's an end quote. So be authentic. This is the most important thing of all when it comes to DNI and communications. Mr. King told me that the most challenging thing is staying authentic in a nation where everything is so quickly changing. He said, you have to, you have to maintain your values and not let society change who you are, but Remember that you will have to compromise to stay relevant. Don't miss out on the opportunity to grow your DNI understanding because you're afraid of saying or doing something wrong or offensive. I, I have horses and, uh, and I've been taught to handle horses with my heart in my hands. If you touch a horse with your heart in your hands, the horse will never respond with distrust or fear. So as communicators, put your heart in your voice, put your heart in your words. If you navigate through the world of diversity and inclusion like that, you will never hurt or offend anyone the rest of your career or the rest of your life. And so I'll wrap up with um, some words from Yolanda King. Uh, again, she's the daughter of Martin Luther King III. And uh, I spoke to her on Valentine's Day earlier this year. She said, you know, if I could wave a magic wand and change some things in the world, the first thing I would do is put one big magic spell of peace across the world. People would understand that everyone is part of our community. The whole world is one big community, if you think about it. She says, we shouldn't hate anyone because they are a human being. Then she said, most of our world's problems are caused by people. This is an 11 year old girl. Most of our world's problems are caused by people. If every person was treated with dignity and respect, that would solve most of the problems in our world. And then she said, you see, Miss Carla, I have a dream too. So that concludes my presentation. I think it was a little bit short, but hopefully that will leave us time for some questions. Um, and I am opening up the chat right now. And if there are any questions that way that you wanna pose, I'm happy to help and answer. Any challenges you might be facing in your own DNI efforts? Carla, one person posted that it's really tough at her place because all the senior staff and board chairs are all white. And so it's a barrier she's running up against. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, um, it, is, it is very difficult to move the needle if you are speaking to um, decision makers who are tone deaf. And so, my suggestion is to not get frustrated on what you can't do, but to focus on what you can. If there is diversity at all, and I don't know what kind of um, business this individual is in, but if there's diversity at all in, in your audience, in your um, employees, if you're, you know, if you're writing about the employee of the month or if you're interviewing someone for a feature, um, find that diversity 
in your organization and tell the, that person's story. Draw, you know, cast a, a spotlight on the diversity you do have rather than worrying so much right now about what the balance is. Um, and by telling those stories, you will help educate and sort of shift the, the stance of, of people who may have put up a wall. And hopefully you'll attract more people who are, um, are diverse in nature and, and, see you telling, and see you telling those stories. Carla, what books have helped you grow your understanding of other people and their perspective? Oh gosh. You know, I have to be honest. Um, I can't think of a book right off the top of my head, but I do, um, I do listen to a lot of podcasts. I do, you know, read, I'm a kind of a junkie reader. I don't always pay attention to who's writing it, and, which is probably a bad thing to say, but, you know, I scan, I read, I, I you know, click on videos. I look, um, I, I, I search under, you know, keywords. Um, my biggest source about, about, you know, this topic is talking to my colleagues. I have colleagues that are um, from diverse communities. And in the past, I wouldn't have said a word. I mean, I really wouldn't have. I, I, I thought, well, if I'm being kind and warm and engaging with that person, that's my job. That's all I can do, right? Um, but, but with the shift in the, in the attention of our nation on diversity and inclusion and equity and access over the last few years, I have become a little more emboldened and I have specifically asked friends and colleagues, like I did for this presentation. I called up a friend of mine who's homosexual and I said, um, hey, I need to talk to you and get some advice from you, at, you know, as a gay man um, on these questions that I'm going to pose to this wonderful audience of, of women communicators. And, and you know, as a gay man, what, what kind of advice, what kind of perspective do you have about how to handle some of these tough questions? I would never have done that a few years ago, no way. But, but um, the spotlight that has been shown on these, on these um, topics has emboldened me a little bit. And I try to have really intimate, personal conversations. I reach out to people and I just say, hey, I really need your perspective here. And I take lots of notes. And then the second part that's really important is I follow up with them later and I share with them what I did with what they told me. So, hey, by the way, you know, the other day you and I talked and you talked about this. I put that into practice. I wanted to tell you, here's what happened. Um, they, just, they just really wanna be heard and, and seen. So um, that's, that's been really helpful to me. I would say, look at the people in your community, look at the people in your life, look at the people, your colleagues, the customers, the people you do business with and, and reach out to them. That's great, thanks, Carla. Sure. Um, when you talked about doing an audit, do you include ads in the count, stock photos, things like that? Yeah, we included when, when, when Signature Magazine did its audit, we included everything because um, it's, it's how people, it's how the reader perceives you, right? So if the reader's getting the magazine and flipping through it and they see uh, how, whatever they see, they don't know necessarily anything about a DNI initiative that you may or may not have, right? Unless you happen to be advertising it. Um, most groups don't. So, so they don't know anything about, about that. And so we wanted to see how, you know, how do people perceive us? How would just the average person picking up the magazine perceive us? So we did, we counted the representation in ads, um, even though it's not content we can control, but we did. And stock photos, which we can control because we chose them. Great, good information. Yeah, and there's, you know, there's actually, I, that, that brings up another point. Um, when we started shining a light on this at Signature, my graphic designer said, you know, there's so many times where I go and pick an illustration and it's, you know, it's all white hands in the illustration. He said, I could easily have picked an illustration with a dark hand in it or, a, or, have, or I could have changed the color of the illustration myself. And he goes, it never crossed my mind because my hands are white, right? Um, it's just, it's about becoming more self-aware and um, it, it's, it's not something that's gonna happen unless it will, it will happen, but it may not, you may not move the needle in a, in a measurable way unless you bring it out into the open and start having the discussion with your teams. So true, so true. Um, one person shared um, for their membership organization, is there a set of recommended guidelines for configuring race, ethnicity questions on a membership application? They want to be sure they're using correctly accepted nomenclature 
and not leaving anyone out? Yeah, that is a fabulous question. And, and I personally am not um, involved in membership acquisitions or anything like that, but um, I would refer you to um, some of the resources that were in the presentation, the conscious style guide and those databases and the conscious language newsletter. Um, that's, I think it's a free subscription. I would, I would highly recommend that you check into those kinds of things. They, um, there are resources put out um, by her that, that specifically address that, that kind of language. Um, I know that she's also um, part of an association and she's very open to people um, reaching out to her and asking questions. So if you tried to connect with her on, on, um, on LinkedIn, you could probably ask her directly if you don't find the answer to your questions when you look at her resources. Um, but yeah, that is, a, that is, a, that is a, an excellent question. And the fact that you're even asking it tells me that you're in the right direction. Um, and it's probably something that's always changing, uh, you know, keeping in touch with how language is changing, um, you know, think about our sports teams, right? I mean, we've, we've had, we've had, you know, the Indians and the Braves and on all these sports teams that for years and years, nobody thought anything of. And now these teams are, are, are being, you know, renamed. People are looking at things, things are changing. They're always changing. Things that used to be taken for granted and okay, aren't okay anymore. Um, and so, so I think, you know, going to those resources and then really paying attention to what's going on in our world and how language is evolving and making sure that any shifts in language, anything that used to be okay, but maybe now is considered insensitive, you have to regularly review your communications and your materials to make sure that you aren't missing any of that language. For sure. And I wanna let everyone know there's a few links that have been shared in the chat to some of the resources that Carla mentioned as well as Carla's LinkedIn bio, you can reach out to Carla and she will send you a copy of the presentation, which um, mentions some of the resources as well. Um, a couple people commented, Carla, um, with your example about a person's name, someone said, I really appreciate the example about the importance of a person's name. And someone else said, yes, and please correctly pronounce someone's name. Flubbing it is unacceptable as well. Good resources, thanks, Carla. Yeah, no problem. I, I yeah, and and with a name like Caligaritas, right? Good Greek name. Um, and I always put people at ease about my name. But but you know, someone's first name especially is so personal to them. Um, and, and this young man, Kalaya, he's very proud of of his heritage, and you know, and and um, he's you know, it was something that that being there as a witness. I, I was, it was a tough thing because, you know, the mother in me wanted to step up and say something, you know, I wanted to look at this woman CEO and go, are you kidding me? That's his name, you know, but, but I knew it would also kind of undermine him and embarrass him. You know, he's an emerging professional. He's trying to make an impression with her as well. Um, but it, it really was astounding to me uh, that she wasn't willing to call him by his, his given name because it was too hard to remember. That that was pretty uh, shocking to to hear that that's how she treated him. I, I hope she that he uh, went and found somewhere else to go work. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It's it's a one year internship, so I guess he'll you know hopefully he'll have some some opportunities and maybe he'll have an opportunity to have an honest and frank conversation. You know, as Mr. King said, it's the young people that are leading the discussion on this. Yep. Well, I want to thank Carla and everyone else for being here today. Um, this was just such a great conversation and it'll be nice if there's a day when we can all get together and have this conversation in person. But um, this was a way for us to bring Carla to all of us, you know, here in uh, central Illinois and possibly all over, you know, the country too. We've had people sign up for the presentation that are from everywhere. So Thank you, Carla, for helping uh, us to reach a, such a broad audience. And so many comments are coming in now saying, you know, great program and thank you so much. Um, oh, so nice. So thank you. So thank you. And, and hopefully some, uh, some of the attendees will be reaching out to you to follow up more. Um, I'm sure yeah. that you have so many ways that you can help them. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to help in any way that I can. And again, you know, not, not an expert in this, um, someone who's on the journey with you. Um, but, but, um, I am happy to help in any way. And if I can't personally help, I'll probably know someone who can. Well, we, we appreciate it. And, um, and this is, you know, gave us a lot of really great things to think about. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, Thanks for inviting me. So Sarah, if you want to jump back on and, and wrap things up and, um, share some information about, we have some great programs upcoming. We're just working really hard to continue to 
jump on Zooms and share information with each other. So Sarah, welcome you back on. Yeah, thanks, Carla. This was a great topic, um, very timely. Um, I'm sure that it will not be the last conversation that many of us have about this topic. So um, thanks for sparking the interest or progressing anyone who's working on this actively in their role. Um, so I just wanted to say um, shout out to all of our new members who are joining us. We had a big membership drive in October and we had a lot of people join us. So thanks for joining. Um, we're hopeful that you're getting things out of this organization that you were looking for. We are planning kind of, um, we did a happy hour back in July, kind of just chatting about the Corona and what was happening with everyone's crisis communications. And so um, we're planning kind of a holiday happy hour. It will be on Zoom just because, you know, case counts are surging like crazy everywhere. So um, we'll do a Zoom happy hour for the holidays and maybe, um, you know, everybody get a fun holiday drink at your house and join us kind of thing. Um, we don't have a date yet set um, unless Christy loves, we picked a date. I don't know of yet. Um, not yet. Okay, well, we'll put that on social media and send that out in an email once we choose a date. So um, after that, then in January, we have um, Josh Hester, many of you know from Storyteller Studios in town in Springfield. Um, he will be presenting on how to create videos and when to choose video for your marketing tactics. So um, he is going to share some tips and tricks with us for making videos. So that's January 14th, I believe. Right. Thursday the 14th. <laughs> yeah, and so that'll be a Zoom presentation as well. So if you have any um, concerns about doing video with your marketing tactics or not sure when video is the right fit or maybe how to use video on your phone, that sort of thing is what Josh will be talking about with us. Um, so we hope that you'll join us in the upcoming programs that we have. I, um, we're always open to your feedback. If you have comments, questions, ideas, thoughts, um, I really do wish that we could have networking in person. Um, I know that that's something that a lot of you probably look for in an organization like this. And I hope that, you know, maybe if we all wear our mask for the next couple of months, we'll be back in person um, in the spring or we can do something outside. But um, I think for now, this is a great opportunity for us to learn some really great um, topics and be together on Zoom. So thank you, Carla, for presenting to us today. We appreciate your time, your effort, and your insights. So um, with that, if anyone wants to continue chatting, you can. <laughs> I don't know how else to do a networking um, virtually, but um, thanks for your time. And everyone, I hope you enjoyed it. I did put links to our Facebook page. If you want to follow us on Facebook, you'll get um, all of our event updates there, as well as a link to our chapter website. We post event announcements there, membership information, resources. So um, please feel free to contact us through our website, through social media, um, and watch your emails for updates. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.